Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will see that animals can learn to use the stimuli to respond less in addition to responding more. The examples we have seen so far in Pavlovian and instrumental conditioning have all been examples of excitatory conditioning, that is, examples where animals learn to do more of something, be it a Pavlovian conditioned response or an instrumental action. In this lesson, we will look at inhibitory conditioning, that is, at conditioning that makes responding less likely. The basic idea is to arrange a negative relationship between a stimulus and an outcome. I will talk about Pavlovian conditioning, but things work similarly in instrumental conditioning. For example, we can show to the animal that a stimulus, say a bell, signals food, but only when it is alone. When the said stimulus is together with the second one, for example a light, no food comes. This arrangement is indicated in this table. We see bell followed by pizza, and bell plus light, followed by no pizza. In this case, we might think that the animal learns something like, okay, the bell causes food, but the light cancels the food. At this point, we would like to see what the animal thinks of the light. The simplest thing that I've called here the naive test would be to show the light on its own. But this is usually does not give us much information. For example, think about a salivation conditioned response in dogs, like in Pavlov's original experiment. In that case, the dogs would learn to salivate to the bell alone and to not salivate to the bell and light together. If we show them the light alone, however, what would the dogs do? We can guess that they would not salivate, but this would not tell us whether they just did not learn anything about the light or whether they learned that it stops food delivery. In either case, the dogs would just not salivate. For this reason, scientists came up with two tests that are more informative. The first test is called the summation test. It consists of introducing a third stimulus, here indicated by the speaker symbol. This stimulus is trained exactly as the bell was in the first part of the training, that is, in this example, followed by pizza. The test consists of putting this third stimulus together with the light. If the light does nothing in the mind of the animal, there will be no difference between responding to the speaker and to the speaker plus light. But if the animal has learned that the light prevents the appearance of food, they should respond less to the speaker plus light than to the speaker alone. So, by introducing a third stimulus that is known to cause the response, we can check whether the light can interfere with that response. If it does, we say that the original training, which had consistent of bell followed by food and bell plus light followed by no food, had caused the light to become an inhibitory stimulus for the animal. That is, we now have a stimulus that decreases a certain behavior rather than increasing it. The second test is called the retardation test. The idea is that if the light is now inhibitory, it should take longer to train a response to it than if it were a neutral stimulus. So the retardation test tries to condition the same CR to the light that was learned to the bell, and compares the speed of this learning with the speed of learning a CR to another stimulus, here a light of a different color. If learning to the first light is slower, we infer that the animal had initially learned that the light prevents food, and that it had to reverse this belief during the test. Let's see both tests at work in an actual experiment, performed by Tobler and colleagues on macaque monkeys. The stimuli in this experiment were different shapes on a computer screen, which here I indicate with letters as used by the original authors. The reward was fruit juice, and the conditioned response measured was licking of the fruit juice spout. In other words, when the monkeys learned that the stimulus signals the delivery of fruit juice, they licked the spout in anticipation. The experimental design in the table is a bit more complicated than what was on the previous slide, but we'll go through it step by step. First, we should recognize the basic condition inhibition training, that is a stimulus A that is reinforced here, and a compound of two stimuli A and X that is not reinforced. As we see in this first graph, the animals licked more in response to A alone, the black line, than A plus X, the red line. As mentioned in the previous slide, however, we cannot directly see what the monkeys learned about X. Everything else in the experiment is a setup to enable us to find this out. To make the summation test possible, another stimulus C was trained during the first phase. 
Then responding to Cx and Cy was recorded, where Y is a stimulus that had not previously been reinforced. The idea is to check whether X would decrease responding to C. The comparison between Cx and Cy was done to give us more confidence in the result of the experiment. In fact, if we had compared Cx and C alone, as I indicated in the previous slide, we would be open to an objection. Maybe Cx could be lower, not because X has become an inhibitory, but simply because the monkeys are seeing a new combination of C stimuli, C and X, which they had never seen before, and this could throw them off. To avoid this objection, the authors introduced two extra stimuli, B and Y, and arranged them in a training that is identical to the condition inhibition training with A and X, apart from the fact that B alone was not reinforced. This results in a stimulus Y that has a very similar experience to X, but it should neither excite nor inhibit responding. The result was that X inhibited responding to C completely, as we can see from the complete absence of responding to C and X together. On the other hand, the monkeys responded quite a bit to C together with the neutral stimulus Y. In other words, X passed the submission test by being able to inhibit responding to a stimulus that had independently been trained as an exciter. At this point, the authors also performed a retardation test. Up to now, neither X nor Y have ever been reinforced. But we suspect from the results of the summation test that X is now an inhibitory stimulus, while Y is still a neutral stimulus. To further check this conclusion, the retardation test reinforces responding to both X and Y. The results were that monkeys learned CR to X much more slowly than to Y, further strengthening our conclusion from the summation test that X is indeed an inhibitory stimulus. In summary, we have learned that stimuli can come through conditioning to inhibit behavior. Moreover, when this happens, they can inhibit behavior in a variety of situations, not only in the presence of the same stimuli where the inhibition was learned. As for other findings that we are looking at in our lessons, we will see an explanation of how inhibition learning may work in the coming lessons on the Roscon and Wagner model of condition. This lesson is over. Here are some suggestions of what to study next. Happy learning to everyone.